turn back the clock and retrace the remarkable journey of disco's very own poster boys. Beginning at an early age, the Gibb brothers had a desire to be famous. The pathway to fame for these three brothers was filled with success, conflict, and tragedy as they sought to conquer the world of popular music. Introducing the British three-part harmony, the Bee Gees. Natives to the Isle of Man off the northeast coast of England, the Gibbs, older brother Barry and twins Robin and Maurice, were born into a musical family in years 1946 and 1949 respectively. Music was in their blood. My father was a drummer for 30 years, and my mother a band vocalist, and that's how they met. And that's how we were thought of. As rock and roll was materializing in the 1950s, the Gibb family moved to Manchester, where the brothers formed their skiffle group, the Rattlesnakes. They regularly mimed to the current hits of the day until a broken record helped reveal a talent they never knew they had. Ball fire. Actually, how we started is a story in itself. We'd always loved singing around the house, and uh, there was a cinema nearby where we were able to stand on stage and lip-sync to records. We called ourselves the Rattlesnakes then. Normally, we'd have a chance to rehearse the record, rehearse lip-syncing to it, and be ready. But that day, there was no turning back. So we had to go on stage and we had to sing for real. And I can tell you now, looking back, we were pretty young, pretty hungry, but we found out we could sing. Lollipop, lollipop, oh, lollipop, lollipop, oh, lollipop, lollipop, lollipop. What happened was on the way for cinema, we broke the record that we were going to mind to. And uh, we'd been practicing singing at home. We found out we had a natural harmony, but uh, we didn't understand what we were doing. And uh, we decided at that point to sing instead of mine. In about 1958, we emigrated to Australia and um, went to live in Brisbane. Rarely residing in one place for long, the Gibbs were on the move once more in 1958, looking for a new opportunity. With the addition of their youngest sibling, Andy, the family emigrated down under. Their journey to the emerging country of Australia would inform their songwriting for years to come. From the outset, the Gibb brothers set about displaying their newly found harmony to the public. Touching down, the brothers were now known as the Brothers Gibb. This is the beginning of their transformation into the musical powerhouse that is the Bee Gees. I think we've probably had pretty much what, what any artist has if they start as young as we had and work your way up to where you're getting like. We went through all the small clubs, all the small hotels, any television work we could get. We were three kids with a guitar, you know. But everything was very young in Australia. Show business was very young, even in the world that we were in. Uh, the, our particular area of the show business world. I mean, TV was young, the uh, recording industry was very young. Publicity people were very young. There wasn't no, publicity people were very old. <laughs> <laughs> but they had no idea of how to sell an artist or anything like that, because we were yeah. all very young business, you know. But we, we spent most of our time working to adults. Yeah? yeah, we were very young kids at the time. We weren't a major recording group. Well, kids don't sell records. Kids don't sell records. We had about 13 flops in a row. Regardless of their self-assessed failures, their flops caught the attention of TV producers, earning themselves several television performances. Here is... The Battle of Blue and Grey, performed in 1963. Oh, 
Back on home soil, the intense fan frenzy of Beatlemania was in full swing. Jealous and striving for similar success, the Bee Gees made a decision to return to their native land in 1966. Ironically, the Gibb brothers received their first chart success in Australia with Spicks and Specks, the week they embarked on their voyage home. Where is the sun that shone on my head? The sun in my life, it is dead, it is dead. Where is the light that would play in my streets? And where are the friends I could meet, I could meet? The girl that I love, she is gone, she is gone. How did you make it, anybody? You, you, I believe, made a secret LP over here. Yes, we did. This is before we left for England. Um, we made a private LP with a guy called Ozzy Byrne, who had a pri his own private little studio. And um, we made the album ourselves, and our father sent it over to England to various agents and that. But we had no sort of contacts. Nobody returned our, uh, our um, mail or anything like that. We arrived in England, and uh, we went to see the Great Elk Organization, who told us that it was highly competitive, which we already knew, and said to, um, in a way, to forget it, you know, to go home and, and work it out over here. And um, this man was Eddie Jarrett, who managed the Seekers. He said there were too many groups around so two years ago. Since then, there's about a dozen new groups come up and hit the top. With their father's encouragement, the brothers paid for their long trip home by entertaining the passengers on board. Their main objective by returning to England was to track down Beatles manager Brian Epstein and his colleague Robert Stigwood. Ahead of our trip, we sent these records and acetates and things to Brian Epstein. And it was in a matter of the two weeks that we were there that uh, one night Robert Stigwood, who was managing director that night, decided they would play these tapes and these records. So they both sat and played them. And we don't know how he got our phone number, but. We found us up and uh, we never then the next week we signed a five year no. He believed they could usher in a following similar to the Beatles. Stigwood backed his hunch with serious financial investment, which paid off. The brothers received their first chart hit, both in the US and the UK, with the single New York Mining Disaster 1941 in 1967. By 1968, the brothers, including guitarist Vince Maloney and drummer Colin Peterson, topped the singles charts for the first time with Massachusetts. A ballad that was originally intended to fulfill the band's dream of writing a hit for The Seekers. Because we were so absorbed in, in what we regarded as a hobby, uh, we, we pretended to, to write people we heard on the radio. We pretended to write their next record. And it, was a, it became like football to other kids. It became a hobby, this, yeah. It became a hobby. Yeah. And we, it just grew uh, with the yes. years into adulthood uh, because we didn't want to do anything else and we didn't want a boss. See you. 
Robert Stigwood's prediction was materializing as the Bee Gees started to amass a fervent following, regularly generating scenes of pandemonium. Releasing hit after hit, the Bee Gees rapidly gained traction, aided by a hectic touring schedule. This scares me all right, but if there wasn't any public enthusiasm, it would scare me more. We are trying to capture a wider audience, but they're then just uh, and teenagers. Barry, what do you think of the pop scene over here? You've been away from it uh, for some time now. You have complete factual opinion. I think it stinks. Why? And I think there are thousands of people who will agree with me in the pop business here. It reeks. And um, it reeks, and a lot of it's crooked, and I'm not afraid to say it. I would have been afraid to say it when I lived here, but I'm not in the least bit afraid to say it now. I suppose, and, that, and that's not because, you know, I've had some success. Big deal, I'm very good, so what? You know, I'm just saying exactly what I think. There is nothing here for the kids. Nothing is being done for the kids. Nobody seems to be interested in doing anything for the kids. Um, all they do is put on adult shows for adult people, and the, the teenagers are left, and, and all you read about in the papers is, is um, rapes and murders, and young kids walking the streets. If they had places where kids could go and have some fun, and I mean places, big places, where they could go and have some fun, not the, the jukebox and slot machine stuff. The Bee Gees ended 1968 by topping the charts with, I've got to get a message to you. The song, based on a death row prisoner passing on his final message to his wife, continued the trend for the looming superstars. Their first venture to American soil proved unsuccessful, but that didn't halt the vast amount of awards the band continued to obtain from around the globe. What do you do to stay there, to stay successful? Because you are. <laughs> you keep saying that. Um, what do I do to stay? All right, for me to say. I keep not quiet. <laughs> I keep quiet. I stay home, and I give that to anybody who's going over there. Stay out of the clubs. I stay out of the clubs because that's the place where you become ruined because you can go to the, the, the end club, which is um, the revolution in England, which is the Beatles sort of, um, Beatles castle, where everybody goes, the Stones and Jimi Hendrix, um, all these people, and they all go, and they all just sort of sit around and talk and drink all night until they look like ghosts, you know. And uh, this is the beginning of the end, when you pop out, they're late, the late night lunars every night of the week. And uh, the only way to stay, as you say, to stay up there, is to stay at home, stay out of sight. You never see Tom Jones. You never see Englewood up there. You never see any of these people that look healthy or are healthy or, or, or are at the top and are going to stay there because they don't go out. They just are not seen, and that's the price you pay. Stay, stay in. We sang and we wrote songs, and we didn't know how good those songs were. And um, it's just very, it's, it's very hard. Everyone else is in control. You're not in control. And uh, so the promotion becomes the hype, and it's all built up, and people put money up behind it. And we were t titled as the, uh, the new, the most, the most, significant most significant new musical talent of 1967. Well, to us, we didn't even know what that meant. The band ended the decade on a high when I Started a Joke hit the charts in America. Two.
the songs strengthen their support from across the pond. I watch the apples falling one by one And I recall the moment of them all The day I kissed your cheek and you were gone And you don't ask the time of day. But you and I are not well In public, the facade of the Bee Gees seemed cheerful. In reality, fame and fortune was harming the harmony of the pop troupe. And I was smiling. speaking to you from a club in... Uh... In Hamburg, and uh, I'm Barry Gibb of the Bee Gees. Robin here. Robin, we've heard rumours that the group is splitting up. Would you like to verify those rumours? You say it, you say it. I don't know. Thank you very much, Mr. Peterson. How about you, Mr. Maloney? Oh, no, I don't think it is. Come in, come in. <laughs> no, no, no. If I was to say that was true, then I would be the Premier of Russia. Despite his words, Robin embarked on producing a solo record titled Robin's Reign. The single, Saved by the Bell, became a major hit and affirmed Robin's choice to go solo. The, the remaining brothers, Barry and Maurice, both starred in the comedy television special Cucumber Castle, which also became a studio album. Their celebrity status thrust the family feud into the limelight, unable to silence the rumor mill of the press. It wasn't just Robin leaving the group. It was a whole combination of elements that were good and bad. It was like a family argument made public. It was a testing time for all three brothers. However, the siblings' rivalry intensified when Don't Forget to Remember from Cucumber Castle performed equally as well as Robin's releases. That it's true. I can get over anything. You are my love, but I can get myself over you. Tomorrow Tomorrow became another hit success without the assistance from their brother, Robin. You said goodbye, girl. It's just too much. Hey, I swallowed each and every last that you gave to me. Well, I'm the man that I was and the future that can be.
By the end of 1970, after an 18-month hiatus from the band, Robin reunited with his brothers. At the direction of Robert Stigwood, the boys revived their harmony and marked the occasion with their first U.S. number one, How Can You Mend a Broken Heart? Can you stop the rain from falling down? How can you stop the sun from shining? What makes the world go round? How can you mend this broken man? How can a loser ever win? Momentum for the band dissipated over the following years. My World, released in 1972, demonstrated this decline in popularity. In an attempt to rebound, the brothers took to the road once more, performing in small clubs in the north of England. Unfortunately, the decline continued, and by 1974, the Bee Gees barely regained any popularity. Persevering, the band looked to legendary record producer Arif Mardin to help relaunch their brand. The American-Turkish producer, who had worked with the likes of Queen, aimed to reinvent the sound of the Bee Gees just as the disco scene was emerging. We did two albums with Arif Mardin, yeah. a producer, a record producer in New York, and uh, he's an ex excellent producer. He's like an old uncle. Old, most artists look up to this man. He's like a doctor. Yeah. Not, not that we were in need of a doctor, mind you. Yeah. Yeah. Think about it. <laughs> my, um, my, piles, my piles were playing up. Yes, time, yeah. Robin's... Um, anyway, we won't go into that. But we made two albums. One was Mr. Natural, uh, which didn't do well at all. And uh, uh, But we... But we us and Arif stuck together and made another album following, thinking that we were on the right track, we were making a transition somewhere, let's see where we're going. After trial and error, the new perspective proved to be a musical sensation. Earning themselves another American chart topper with Jive Talking in 1975.
Their first big disco hit was followed by another from the same album. At the request of Arif Martin, Nights on Broadway featured the Gibbs' first falsetto, the high-pitched tone that would become a hallmark of the Bee Gees' new sound. Supported by Arif Martin, the brothers persisted with their hidden love of rhythm and blues. How'd this rock and roll all get started, anyway? Well, what would they call rock and roll now, rhythm and blues? But something was standing in their way. Still made the nobody wanted to hear that sort of music from the Bee Gees. But we were writing it and, and even recording on demos, but nobody of uh, the record company that we were with before that time uh, did not want to release Bee Gees R&B because they thought in those days it wasn't right for a white group to release that You've kind got, of music. It, the idea was give us as many ballads as yeah. you can. You see, yeah. white group just didn't do R&B music prior to 1974. Fanny Be Tender With My Love in 1976 proved record companies wrong. Seems like you don't want the love. Producing a soulful composition that married rhythm and blues with pop balladry harmoniously. They successfully navigated their way back into the spotlight. Main course proved to be a massive success, but was ultimately overshadowed the following year as the band soared to new heights. Me, you, me. 
disco was the soundtrack of the 70s. Robert Stigwood recognized the Bee Gees' potential to dominate the genre. Stigwood used the band's music in a film he was producing, set in the colorful lights of New York's night scene. Saturday Night Fever, starring an unknown John Travolta. of music and movie. You cannot plan success. Just... Nobody knows what's going to be successful. Either they've got an idea what might be successful, but nobody said it's going to be that successful. It's going to be so big, and then we're going to release the three, four singles off this album. <laughs> we're going to get four top ten it, yeah. at the same time. No, no but uh, yes. if I do oh, this, we have a subconscious have feeling of what we know what might be successful, yes. That's absolutely but true. But you, you can't plan it in a way a Saturday Night Fever was done. A Saturday Night Fever, uh, nobody expected the success of Saturday Night Fever had. <laughs> Following the massive success of Saturday Night Fever, Robert Stigwood decided to feature the Gibb Brothers in his next project, a musical based on the characters in the Beatles album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. In contrast to Saturday Night Fever, the film which also featured Peter Frampton, Earth, Wind and Fire, Aerosmith, Alice Cooper and Curtis Mayfield, was a cinematic disaster and failed miserably at the box office. We 
never liked you. We knew it was a disaster. We knew it was a disaster. That's how we were doing it. Not we did that there, you see. There we knew. We knew oh, it was yeah. a bad thing. A, we, don't, we didn't like the idea of... We tried to talk our way out of the film, but 20% into the film. Yeah. yeah. For a start, we didn't like the idea of doing other people's music anyway. We were doing our own music. Saturday Night Fever is what saved us from Sgt. Pepper, because yeah. Sgt. Pepper was being made, and when that film was just being finished, Saturday Night Fever was just taking off. Yeah, right. And if it hadn't been for Saturday Night Fever, the Bee Gees would have been in another valley at this point, or, or we'd have been in another valley at that point when Saturday Night Fever was supposed to come out. And it, it just it saved us. All was forgotten in 1979 as the brothers turned their eye to philanthropy. Teaming up with UNICEF, the band organized an all-star pop concert in New York City, featuring the likes of ABBA, Olivia Newton-John, and Rod Stewart. With each performer donating royalties from one of their songs. The concert raised $100 million, while the Bee Gees raced over $7 million with their donation of Too Much Heaven. By this time, another Gibb brother had joined the limelight. There was a child around our house. We all think it's only fair that we give him a break at last. So won't you please welcome my younger brother, Andy Gibb. On the back of three number one hits, Andy was on course to reach the heights of success his brothers had achieved. Anticipating their own demise, the Bee Gees spent most of 1979 playing large venues in a preemptive farewell tour. The Bee Gees' success was their disadvantage. Being household names in the disco phenomena made the brothers prime targets as the Disco Sucks movement swept across mid-America in the summer of 79. The attack on funky bass lines was fueled by racism and homophobia against a genre that was accepting to all. The death of the movement coincided with the demise of disco, but the Bee Gees were prepared and launched their songwriting and solo careers. Just being an artist now is, is, is exciting, but you want to try other things. You have to 
try and branch out, do find out what other abilities you have, if any, you know. See, it, it also the and, fact uh, that uh, I like to point out too, because of being the producers and also writers, is that the reason that Saturday Night Fever, for instance, when we did the score, that we wrote the music for the for our album actually, but they used that movie, that music for that movie. So uh, we proved one thing there that we can write soundtracks for films. We don't we don't write old disco or dance type no. music. We can write any kind. So this is the kind of thing we prove with Saturday Night Fever, which I don't think many people picked up on. For me, when I, when I was asked to do Barbara Streisand, I didn't believe a word of it until I met Barbara Streisand and she said to me, this is going to work, we're going to do it. Barry and Barbara's duet on Guilty earned the pair a Grammy Award. Following the critical success, Barry teamed up with Diana Ross and Michael Jackson to produce her 1985 album, Eden Alive. As Maurice focused his time on writing film scores, Barry and Robin persevered with their solo projects. Back up high and down three times already. We'll go on making our music, we'll go on believing in our music. The solo projects pose no threat to the Bee Gees, as the brothers headed back to the studio in 1987 to record their reunion album, ESP. Viewed as a last chance to reach the charts, the Bee Gees spent most of their time working on the album. It was successful in Europe, making them the first group to score a UK number one in three separate decades. Over in America, the anti-disco prejudice caused the album to flop. The rest of 1987 was spent rehearsing with their youngest brother, Andy, as they aimed to include him into the lineup. On March 10th, 1988, only days after his 30th birthday, the Bee Gees' younger brother, Andy, sadly passed away due to heart complications caused by a viral infection. Although not an overdose, his past alcohol and drug problems made his heart more vulnerable to the illness. The broken-hearted brothers attempted to record Wish You Were Here, a song inspired by Andy. The 
recording sessions were difficult, and they soon gave up. Maurice relapsed into drinking, and the Bee Gees settled on taking six months off. The disco hitmakers returned to the stage in 1989 to complete a world tour. After a busy year touring, the Bee Gees stepped out of the spotlight until the release of Size Isn't Everything in 1993. The Bee Gees continued their philanthropic ventures throughout the 90s. How did you get involved with the event tonight, or who asked you to... Uh... We were invited to dinner at the Davises about uh, early at the beginning of the year, and they asked us if we would do it, and we didn't hesitate. We said we'd love to do it, you know. Because we were saying earlier, we, we do the same kind of thing in Miami Beach. We have one every year to raise money for diabetes. So when we were asked to do this, it's a cause that's close to our heart. Our grandmother passed away from it. So we said, without thinking, yes, we'd do it. We'd love to. Yeah, we're very proud to do it, actually. Wow. How about those monkeys getting back together? Who? What? 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 <laughs> the the monk competition? How about, there? What? The <laughs> How about those braves? <laughs> <laughs> and those are very nice glasses you're wearing. I like those. Those are excellent. Where did those come from? Uh, I, I, I don't know, actually. I've forgotten. But, uh, <laughs> somewhere. Somewhere. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all very thank much. You. Is there uh, anything between uh, any... Is John Travolta going to do any dancing tonight? Since I don't think so. Oh. I don't think he's wearing his tights. No. <laughs> 1997. The trio received a series of career honors. Following an induction into the Songwriters Hall of Fame in 1994, the boys were presented with the International Artists Award at the American Music Awards. Further recognition came a few months later with the induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We're very proud, you know, that uh, we can actually be here to receive an award like this. And to be uh, acknowledged for what we've done and over the years is uh, it's a great experience. It's a great sign of respect, a great sign of approval. It's a great sign of, uh, of just being appreciated for what we've done. And no one can beat that. You know, this is what people are in this business for, you know, and it's to us, it's a wonderful night. Thank you for that. Suffering from arthritis, Barry was unable to tour like they used to. Starting in Vegas, he committed himself to performing a series of well-spaced shows around the world called One Night Only. The series of One Night Only shows ended in 1999 with two appearances in New Zealand and Australia. One Night Only in Las Vegas was that, um, you know, a coming together where you suddenly could say to each other, gosh, we've missed this, we haven't done, you know, it's been too long since we did this kind of thing. Is this, is this why the world tour? I, well, I think, uh, you, I think most of it is uh, we've always performed, even when we're in the studio, we're sort of performing together. But the only reason we hadn't been touring that much is because of making the album. And uh, so it takes about, that was about 18 months. So we, we had a lot of time working and writing. Also, we were writing for other people, things like that. So we had a commitment to other artists to write songs for. And, and so we, our time was caught up pretty busily. Because you so. see, apart from being artists and performers, we're also recording artists and songwriters. Let's welcome to Auckland. The Fiji! The dream is to be famous. You don't dream, there are people, I guess, who dream of being wealthy, but uh, we never dreamt of that. Do you think you can ever have too much money? No. No. Nope. <laughs> never chase people to do our songs. You know, we did. We did a long time ago. We used to. <laughs> All I mean, they chase us, but not to do our songs. <laughs> Have you got much in common with bands like Oasis? Yeah, no. we just don't do that. <laughs> uh, well, there is one of us. <laughs> 2001. Four years on from their latest album release, and 45 years on from their debut album release, the Bee Gees released what turned out to be their farewell album. This is where I came in. The band took a break in 2002. It looked like the end of the Bee Gees. January 2003. Maurice was admitted to hospital for abdominal pains. On the 12th of January, at the age of 53, Maurice passed away, awaiting surgery on a twisted intestine. The two remaining brothers eventually retired the Bee Gees' name, memorializing the work they produced as a band of three brothers. The surviving brothers spent the rest of the decade focusing on solo projects and raising money for charities and relief efforts. As 2012 was approaching, Robin had become notably thinner. 
At 61 years old, the legendary BG had been diagnosed with liver cancer. On the 14th of April 2012, after battling the disease for five months, Robin contracted pneumonia and slipped into a coma. Despite having awoken, his health had deteriorated rapidly. Robin Gibb passed away from liver failure on the 20th of May, 2012, leaving Barry as the last remaining Gibb brother. Our sound as three brothers has, uh, has yeah, really weathered is. over the years. People like that. I They're think like there's also sound. an emotional value to the songs, which a lot of artists don't use. And we do a lot of, we use a lot of emotion in our songs. And, and as Barry said, harmonies and... Uh, We're romantic, yeah. Yeah, and it's where they strike a chord with people. And it's kind of, this is kind of universal. And there are countries where they don't even understand the words, where they, they, they hear the emotional value, but they don't understand them. And they will sing along, like in China. <laughs> I'm just planting the seed, folks, so they'll call us up and say, will you come to Australia? Yeah, absolutely. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. headache <laughs> yeah. You get a headache after the night. Yeah, not probably. Not what, what makes Carrying the legacy, Barry Gibb continues to have a solo career. As brothers, the Bee Gees remain as the most successful family act of all time. Their powerful songwriting, harmonious vocals, and diverse song collection proved they were more than just disco hitmakers. They were one of music's originators. After a career spanning five decades, the Bee Gees' legacy is staying alive.